These stories contain distressing themes and brief descriptions of violence. This content is not suitable for children, and listener discretion is advised. As the frost began to thaw on the morning of January 30th, 1992 in Wallington, South London, Nimal Samrasina and his family prepared for work and school. 37-year-old Namal prepared to drive his 12-year-old daughter to school before making the trip to Bristow's Helicopters in Redhill, where he was an avionics engineer. His wife, Florence, would normally get a lift to work too, but that morning she wasn't feeling too well and stayed in. Nimal left the house, opening the gate onto the path. He opened the garage door as his daughter said goodbye to her mother, and then came out. This is how they did things. Namal would get the car warmed up and she would meet him at the end of the lane. Only this time when she got there just minutes later, there was a group of people huddled around. They were all standing around something near her garage. Hesitantly, she approached seeing that someone was on the ground. She recognized the shoes and he wasn't moving. Nimal Samrasina, his jumper soaked in blood, had a single stab wound through his back into his heart. My name's Benjamin Fitton from They Walk Among Us. Welcome to Murder Town, the podcast. Following each episode of Crime and Investigation's True Crime TV series, we'll explore another case right here. When police and ambulance officers arrived at the back of Domain Road, Nimal Samrasina was pronounced dead. Witnesses at the scene described hearing Nimal calling for help as they were either walking along the street or going to their cars nearby. As police continued pinning down neighbours and passers-by, they pieced together a few vital clues relatively early on. One person saw a man, believed not to be Nimal, in the lane near the back gate of the family's property earlier that morning. After his cries for help, another person heard someone running and a neighbour across the road saw a white car screeching down the street shortly after. This sighting was vague but would soon be backed up by further sightings that morning of two men acting suspiciously in a white Ford Orion. Earlier in the morning, another neighbour from across the street noticed a man sitting in a white Orion close to the corner near the Samracena home. He described a man sitting in the front seat as if he was waiting for someone, and his description was an Asian man around 40 to 45 years of age and chubby in his appearance, thick bushy hair pushed back off his face, wearing a beige jacket or rain mac. The driver had a view of both the front door as well as the garage. After this, a woman whose car was parked opposite the Orion was scraping the ice from her windscreen. She didn't witness an Asian man sitting in the driver's seat. She described him as Caucasian, with a thin face and features, possibly around 35 years old, and wearing a flat cap. He was looking in the direction of the Samracena home with his window down. When he saw her notice him, he started the car and drove off. Ten miles southwest of central London, in the greater London borough of Sutton, is the town of Wallington. In the last census, Wallington had a population of 21,000 people, small in comparison to nearby Croydon just three miles east, with a population of 18 times that number. Croydon had become one of the largest commercial districts outside central London, perfectly positioned along a transit corridor between London and the south coast of England, and ultimately the channel crossing to Europe. A simple commute to Croydon, Wallington is an easy choice for people working all across the region. It's seen as relatively safer than Croydon, which has the second highest violent crime rate in England, next to Westminster. But it isn't without its problems. In the most recent report released in 2009 by the Metropolitan Police, of the 18 boroughs of Sutton, 
Wallington South had the fourth highest level of crime in the borough. The three biggest problems were antisocial behaviour, violence and sexual offences. Namal, who was known to his friends as Sam, came to the UK from Sri Lanka in the 1970s as an engineering student. He met Florence, who was Nigerian-born, but had been in Glasgow since 1970 to go to school. After studying, Namal overstayed his visa and was jailed for six months. Shortly after release, he and Florence married and had their daughter. He spent time abroad working in Nigeria and Sri Lanka, where he was employed by Air Lanka as an aircraft engineer, keeping him away from the UK and his family for long periods. That was until he fell out with Air Lanka in 1984 and was fired. He staged a protest at the airport there. The airline were paying higher wages to workers like himself who studied abroad than those workers who had remained in Sri Lanka to study. When Amal returned to the UK, he got a job at Bristow's Helicopters, 45 minutes from Wallington in Redhill. He remained there until his murder as a licensed avionics engineer, maintaining and fixing the electronics of helicopters. He was known to frequently work late nights and weekends and would often bring his daughter with him to learn the ropes of his job. While Namal was working abroad, Florence had got a job at Brent Council in North London as an assistant benefits officer. Her career in local government flourished, and when Namal returned, she applied for the position of chief benefits officer at Croydon Council, and subsequently became the first woman of colour to hold the position, a job which paid a high salary at the time of £30,000 a year and came with dozens of staff reporting into her. Florence had been given the news by detectives and they spent time with her and her daughter trying to find any clue as to why Namal might have been killed. He hadn't been robbed and there wasn't any evidence of a struggle or fight. They needed to find any reason, no matter how small, why someone would want him dead. With the man seen at the garage, the sound of running and the car screeching away, it seemed to them it might have been a hit. When Detective Inspector Tony Kirby, who would lead the investigation, arrived at the home, Florence answered the door. He sat with Florence making notes as she sniffed into her handkerchief. Following protocol, he had checked if there were any police files on the map and wanted to clear some things up with Florence. They were aware of the old record for overstaying his visa, but more recently, there had been five occasions where police had been called to the house. Once by Namal, and four times by Florence. In the first of these call-outs, police arrived to find the couple arguing out in their street. On another occasion when Florence called in, Officers arrived to find the man with a cut on his head. Things escalated, and a third incident occurred where Florence filed the report that Nimal attacked her with a knife. Each time he denied what she was saying was true, and police found it very difficult to work out the facts of what had really happened. Also because Florence never wanted to take it further, nothing concrete happened. Detective Inspector Kirby needed clarity on what had been going on in their relationship, what the arguments were about and why they were happening. And it was then that Florence admitted in floods of tears that she had discovered Namal was involved in the drugs trade. She described late night phone calls with people and strange occurrences and that recently there had been threats on his life. Although Florence is sudden, New information seemed strange. It did seem related to the most recent call-out that the Mal had actually made. Four weeks earlier, on the night of Wednesday, January 2nd, Namal phoned police to say something strange had occurred at the house. At midnight, Namal was awoken by the doorbell. He went downstairs, opening the door to a man he later told police he didn't recognise, but who said he was a neighbour. The neighbour 
explained he had noticed Namal's front door ajar and thought they should know. Police arrived and found no sign of a break-in, and they were never able to track down the supposed neighbour. Maybe this had something to do with drugs. A few days later, Namal installed the fake security camera at the family's front door and an alarm system. The white Orion car came up again when a third witness came forward and said that on the morning after this front door incident, she was walking her dog along Domain Road, as she did regularly just after 7am when she saw a small white Orion approaching. She took notice because it stopped in the middle of the crossing, put its hazard lights on and reversed back up the street as if it had missed the turn into Carew Road. It then made a left turn and pulled over. The witness then turned into Carew Road away from the car and began walking in the opposite direction. She then heard the car reversing back over the crossing again up the road towards her. It continued to reverse up past a number of houses and once again pulled to a stop. She described the driver as being of Asian appearance, although she didn't get a good look at the passenger. This was four weeks before the murder, but the car was the same car and the people in it likely the same people. The two sightings of the Orion sitting stationary outside the house the morning of the murder, where two very different men were described, could have been these same two men who swapped seats at some point while waiting. The investigation continued, but there was no luck in verifying any link Namal may have had to drugs. Officers were out there interviewing everyone who knew the family, and no one was able to back up any of the claims Florence had made of Namal being violent, and their daughter had not backed up these claims either. But police discovered that divorce proceedings were in place between the couple when Namal was killed. There was also set to be a custody battle over their daughter. The day before his murder, Namal sat her down and told her that she may soon have to decide who she wanted to live with. She told police that she said she wanted to stay with him. Less than three months later in April 1992, BBC's Crime Watch profiled the murder. They made an appeal for anyone who might know something to come forward. Although reports of only two men were circulating, the episode called for any information on three, and in hindsight, it is clear that the police knew more than they were letting on at the time. The investigation had, by this time, taken a huge turn. Police had been interviewing friends and colleagues of Nomad, but also of Florence. It was discovered that Florence was £34,000 in debt, and she was convinced that if it got out, she would lose her job as well as custody of their daughter. She was seeking full custody and had looked into the possibility of emigrating to Australia. Her colleagues, some of whom she also owed money to, revealed that she barely spent any time at the office, often coming in the morning and disappearing for the rest of the day. She would say she was going out to catch people who were cheating the housing benefit system, but it was found that she wasn't out working at all. She was going to amusement arcades, and gambling for up to five hours every day, around £1,000 a week on fruit machines. When Namal discovered the debt, Florence didn't come clean about the gambling, and so Namal assumed she was having an affair, spending money on, or with, someone else. During a discussion with Detective Kirby, Florence explained her qualifications and her job at the council, boasting about the recognition she got for her work. Detective Kirby already knew that Florence skipped work regularly and so found this hard to believe. A reference check found that the qualifications she had presented to obtain a position as Chief Benefits Officer at Croydon Council were bogus. She claimed to have seven GCSE O levels and five A levels along with a BA Honours degree from Cambridge. She had none of these qualifications, and no one had ever checked on it. Then came a new discovery that would change the entire direction of the case. 
Convinced of the infidelity, Namal hired a private investigator who followed Florence's every move. To finance her gambling losses and her growing debt, the PI found that Florence had turned to sex work and had been regularly working for a local escort agency. The PI, taking on an alias, made an appointment with Florence through the agency, filming her accepting the money and presented the tapes to Namal. When Florence was confronted about it, she claimed she was going undercover to catch housing benefit scammers. The investigation turned up a number of people who knew Florence through her escort services, and it became clear that she had begun asking around for people who might help her out with something, for someone who might kill her husband. She would go on to tell numerous conflicting stories about her ill treatment at the hands of Namal, telling one person she was gang-raped, another she was repeatedly beaten by him, and another grew to being shot at. It was starting to appear to the investigators that the changing nature of her stories were mirroring her behaviour when Florence was calling police to her home. She was telling different accounts to different people, and the numbers of people she asked to kill Namal were continuing to rise. One of these people's witness statements would secure a warrant for Florence's arrest. Not only was Florence paranoid that her gambling addiction would get out and she might lose the chance of custody of their daughter, but if news of the sex work got out, she would certainly lose her job. After all, she had been doing both activities on work time. The only conclusion the investigation led to was that Florence had decided that murdering the Mal was the only chance she had at keeping her double life a secret from the divorce proceedings and her job. Past that, she would also get over £180,000 from a life insurance policy. In May, just over three months after the murder, Florence Samracina was arrested and charged with soliciting the murder of Namal. The following month, the additional charge of murder was also laid. Gaining the murder charge meant that all the intricate details of the actual murder could be revealed in court, and not suppressed. At trial, Florence pleaded not guilty to both charges. The prosecution was led by Mr. David Calvert Smith QC, who would go on to successfully prosecute Harold Shipman in 2000. He became the director of public prosecutions and then a high court judge. When he stood for the crown against Florence Samracina, he drove home the motive for the killing. She was driven by the need to hide her lies from her family and workplace, and ultimately from the authorities who would decide the custody of her child. The day after Namal was killed, there was a meeting with social services where Namal planned to expose Florence. He had already prepared affidavits revealing the gambling and the sex work she was undertaking on work time, plus myriad other lies. But whether Namal knew she had been plotting to have her husband murdered, no one knows. She was the only person who ever spoke of wanting Namal dead, and she had asked countless people to help her do it. Mr Calvert Smith QC saying in part, quote, The circumstances of the killing prove it was an assassination. She is a strong-willed and manipulative person, prepared to say and do anything to achieve her own ends. She gave every appearance of respectability and responsibility in her high-powered post. The two-minute tape recorded by the private investigator was played to the court. In the video, she can be heard saying, I'm new in this business this year to pay off some debts. If there is anything you want me to do, just say so. It showed Florence in underwear offering the P.I. a massage. He rejected sex and she could be seen giving him back a portion of the money. Exchanging sex for money is not unlawful. However, many activities surrounding sex work are illegal. Essentially, deriving financial gain from the act of prostitution carried out by another person is illegal. You cannot procure or pander on behalf of a sex worker, often referred to as being a pimp or madame. 
If you collect any portion of a sex worker's earnings, you are breaking the law. But a sex worker can legally pay someone to facilitate them in certain areas, such as physical protection or help in advertising their own personal services. Some of the greatest laws surround ways in which sex workers are able to protect themselves by having a safe place of work. It's illegal to own or manage a brothel, but a person can legally provide a physical location for a sex worker to provide services from, as long as they are not profiting from the sex work itself. Additionally, the worker must provide their own transportation to and from the place their sex work will be conducted. According to the law, the manager of an escort agency where all participants are willing, properly paid and treated, may well find that she is committing the serious offence of controlling prostitution, contrary to the 2003 Sexual Offences Act. In Florence's case, police were not able to determine she had done anything unlawful, but there were other areas of concern where the government could have cracked down on her, mostly in relation to her secondary earnings outside her full-time government role. When asked on the stand the reason for her taking on this line of work, she still claimed it was part of her undercover role at the council, saying, it was just part of my job. Florence's defence argued that there was no evidence that any large sum of money had been taken from the family's bank accounts to pay for the supposed contract killer. When witnesses took the stand, it became apparent that Florence had spoken of her hatred of Namal to just too many people. Said by police after the trial, she might as well have gone around with a loud hailer asking if anyone was willing to murder her husband. And one by one, witnesses began to paint a picture of Florence's behaviour in the months leading up to the murder of her husband. The manager of an amusement arcade where Florence often went to gamble, testified that on one occasion Florence told him she had been gang-raped by her husband's friends and shot at. She then said she might take a knife and stick it in him. Florence got to know the arcade manager's girlfriend, who she told the same story, saying she wanted to get rid of her husband. A story then grew. She claimed that Namal had arranged to have her cousin killed so that Florence wouldn't proceed with the divorce. She then said Namal had possibly been interfering with their daughter. It seems that once she began telling this to people, she may have had more interest in her plight. A co-worker at the council stated that Florence told them she wished her husband was dead. Everyone questioned said that they never took her seriously, and none of Florence's accusations could ever be verified. The court heard that when Florence began working at the escort agency and was meeting new people, the frequency of her discussions about Namal increased. A sex worker who met Florence at the end of 1991, a few months before the murder, took the stand. Florence had told her that Namal drugged her, held a gun to her head and had photos of the gang rape that she was adamant would get into the papers. Florence then explained that she had previously paid someone £10,000 to have Namal killed, but it had gone wrong. Namal had found out and beaten her. She then asked this co-worker if she would visit Namal in disguise and drug him. Instead, the woman introduced Florence to a man who she went on to meet with twice. He testified that Florence asked him if he would find someone to kill Namal and that he appeased her by saying he would think about it. Florence chased him up, but he denied ever suggesting anyone. The problem with these witnesses was that they had not come forward to police during the investigation, and the judge made it clear that their reliability was suspect, especially when some contradicted themselves. This was highlighted once again when the next witness, the chairman of the Croydon Police Consultative Committee, took the witness stand because he too had not come forward during the high-profile investigation. He had only come forward when he knew his involvement with Florence might come out. Taken directly from the local government website, the Croydon Police Consultative Committee, or GROUP, 
is in place to assist in informing local policing plans and other local strategy documents. With the help of independent advisors, the committee are able to, based on a community perspective, advise the borough commander about the police management of critical incidents. Advisors are able to critically appraise police actions from the perspective of a receiver of police services and a member of the community, immediately access police decision makers, and appraise resources within the communities that may assist to resolve particular incidents give constructive criticism to the police, to identify options for resolutions of policing problems and assist to secure community confidence. It was the chairman of this committee who took the stand, but not in any official role. He had met Florence through the council and via other voluntary positions he held in the community. When he first spoke to police, he described her in a very positive light which police found contradicting to reports from others at the council. It was four months later that he contacted police to say he had not told the whole truth. He admitted that he had met Florence via a female sex worker who had taken the stand previously. He admitted that while using the escort service, he regularly boasted about his police connections, his ties to SAS, people trained to kill, and he also claimed he knew the craze. This boasting got him an introduction to Florence. Florence told him she would pay £500 to have her husband killed, an offer he claimed he did not pursue. The witnesses continued. Another man met Florence at a barbecue and hoped to obtain a cleaning contract from her via her council office. But instead, Florence told him about her problem and she wanted someone to kill her husband. They met up around five times, and each time she would ask the same question. He stated that he wanted to keep the conversation going about these possible contracts, so he kept saying he would see if he could find someone. Eventually, he introduced her to someone he knew, a doorman who he thought might at least offer her some protection. This doorman was also a witness testifying that he spoke to Florence initially with the other friend, on the basis he would offer her security. But she immediately brought up her husband. She told them both that two prior hits she had arranged had been unsuccessful. He said he never took this request seriously. After Florence started crying and listing all the accusations she had been telling the others about the mouth, these two men felt sorry for her and said they'd see if they could sort something out, but both claimed they went no further with these discussions and had no intention of finding a hit for £500. It was this man, the doorman, who phoned police when news broke of Namal's murder, and although it took some pressure, it was his witness statement that secured the warrant for Florence's arrest. Both the prosecution and the judge described the doorman an opportunist and a rogue. Florence defended herself. In the dock, admitting that she lied to obtain her job, she admitted her misconduct at work. Florence still claimed, however, that she had made a deal with the escort agency to go undercover in order to expose housing benefit fraud. She denied ever asking anyone to kill the man, nor having anything to do with his murder, saying if she really wanted him dead, she could have easily had it sorted out by her family in Nigeria, who were angry at the way she was treated. On the 7th of December 1993, Florence Samracina was found guilty of soliciting to murder Namal by an 11 to 1 verdict. When it came to the murder charge, although the contract killer had not been traced, and is still not to this day, Florence was also found guilty of murder by a 10 to 2 majority vote. She sat slumped over, and as the verdict was read aloud, she could be heard crying no. Florence was sentenced to concurrent terms of life imprisonment for murder, and eight years for the soliciting to murder. The judge, Mr. Justice Phillips, telling her, quote, This murder was not committed in the heat of the moment. 
but was deliberately planned and carried out in cold blood. The verdict was criticised by the Southall Black Sisters organisation, who began campaigning for Florence's release, saying that the all-white jury was prejudicial. Her daughter also campaigned for her release. Her appeals were unsuccessful. After the trial, police revealed that the male had a feeling his wife was plotting his murder. He had made notes of how he would want his funeral to go and the songs he wanted. At the service, family and friends followed his request and the song Stand By Your Man was played. I'm Catherine Kelly, host of Crime and Investigation's true crime TV series, Murder Town. Thank you for joining me on my journey as I visited 10 UK destinations and uncovered 10 stories of murder in Murder Town. If you missed out, catch up on demand at Crime and Investigation and look out for more of our true crime documentaries. For more information on the series, head to crimeandinvestigation.co.uk and let us know your thoughts by searching for Crime and Investigation on social media or using hashtag MurderTown. The MurderTown podcast is hosted by Benjamin Fitton, researched and written by Anna Priestland, and edited and produced by Chloe Frost. 